Good evening, everyone. Time for another silver update. So what you're looking at is the weekly chart of gold. And you can see pretty bullish formation here. We're starting to run away from the last trend line that I drew in there, maybe something like this as we fan into a parabolic rise. So it looks like it's happening, certainly with gold, not yet with silver. We'll look at the gold-silver ratio in a little different way in a bit. So 32.50 on silver is going to be a new interim high, not a new all-time high, a new inter interim high. And that's going to be very important, the difference between those two, just for a lot of technical and fundamental reasons. So, but, but back to gold, uh, 2471, which is where we're trading right now, basically 2500 bucks for gold is going to be a price that uh, we talk a lot about overhead resistance. So once a commodity or stock or anything that's traded is in new all-time highs, there is no technical overhead resistance. Um, there only exists profit-taking resistance, which is resistance created by all the owners. Now with gold, it's very interesting because Pretty much all the gold that has ever been mined in the history of the world is still with us somewhere. It's dug up, I think it was Ed Sakota said, that the history of gold is to be dug up and then buried somewhere and then dug up again and buried somewhere else. Because um, the change of governments, the change of uh, rulers and the change of international uh, power. It, gold will be moved, but uh, it's always just buried again. It's not used in commerce. It's not amenable to commerce at this point. But again, back to the point about overhead resistance. So the overhead resistance consists of profit takers. Now, who are these profit takers? I think before we even ask who are the profit takers, we should ask um, who are the holders and why would they take a profit? Uh, and I don't think we really know who the holders are as far as percentage breakdowns, and I don't think we can verify which central banks hold how much gold and where they hold it. I don't think anything that anything like that is really verifiable to us. So, but every ounce of gold and every bar of gold that's out there becomes uh, profit-taking overhead resistance. And so the big question becomes, well, how, how much of a profit is going to be tempting for them to sell? And then the question I was going to bring up again was, why are they holding it? You have to ask, why is the person who is essentially hiding their wealth. Uh, one of the reasons I think it was um, one of the, or many of the gold haters uh, who don't like gold over the years. Uh, and one of the reasons is because they say it's not productive, it has no yield, and it's not used in lending and all those things. So those things make gold a unique investment and you have to ask why do people invest in it? I think the general consensus is safety. And I would say further than that, uh, distrust of governments would probably be um, a better one. Or just distrust in general, maybe even distrust in markets, governments, corporations, just distrust. So where does the level of distrust have to reach? before people who have physical gold in their possession. Um, and again, we're not talking about paper gold because that's not um, 
if we have a real bull market in gold, I, I would expect it to eventually be the real thing. Could be wrong on that one. But as far as real selling, I'm talking about real holders. Um, so at what price? This is a chart from Long Term Trends. Interesting site. I encourage you to um, check it out. I'll put a link to it. But at what price do the holders of gold that are hedging their bets against governments and uncertainty, when, when are they tempted out of hiding to sell some of it into the market for fiat currencies? So this, this is a kind of a different sort of gold-silver ratio because it's just gold-silver prices overlaid. And you can see this is, we're on the one year and it goes back to um, last summer. And you can see the gold, this is a gold-silver ratio. So you can see that gold-silver ratio is pretty tight. Gold prices are moving about the same percentage as silver prices. We get into the 10-year and then we start to see the sort of divergence between gold and silver. Uh, over a 10-year time frame, um, the price of gold is up 75%. That's from roughly late 2014. Price of silver is up about 50%. Now, this is the 80-year chart. So on an 80-year chart, very interesting, it goes back to the 50s. And they're just about even. You can see that now silver overshot, you can see in, 2000, in 1979 and in 2011, you can see how much silver overshot. Um, in the 1979 bull market, we had about 2,000% uh, increase in the value of gold, whereas in silver, we had almost four times that. So in that time frame, in the 80-year time frame, silver at its spikes outperformed gold uh, by a factor of four in the best scenario. 110-year uh, time frame, uh, for some reason, when we go back to 1920, and this is right after the creation of the Federal Reserve, we go back to that sort of long-term dominance of gold. And of course, when we pull in all data, we'll see that since the 1700s, gold has outperformed silver by a factor of about five. So if we're gonna use that for some type of estimate of what it's gonna to take to get even, then just very roughly about a five-fold move in the price of silver. So with gold at 2,500 and silver, we'll just say 30 bucks. Uh, for this ratio to come and match up and be, you know, where, where it has been in the past, just be even, we would need a $150 silver price. Then of course, if silver overshoots, we're talking 600 is what we get for the price of silver. But again, the overshot uh, market happens during these uh, dramatic blowouts. So we're not anywhere near that yet. So we would expect the 400% overshot if we had a blow off top in say an inflationary scenario we're kind of maybe looking at that now that the Fed seems to be a little bit panicky, whether they miss the ball. Of course, the Fed always misses the ball. Um, they're always late. That's just the Fed. But the Fed's always wrong, always late. The Fed's just the Fed. Nothing you can do about that. But a fourfold overshot in a rampant bull, because I would expect, you know, if we get a rampant bull, I don't, I'm not expecting a bull market like the 70s. I'm not expecting a... Um, you know, thousands of percent re, uh, return. But I mean, there could be. But in a rampant bull, let's just say a moderate bull. Let's say gold goes fourfold. So we get gold up to, say, 10,000 an ounce. Um, then that would put silver uh, 600 is fourfold. So even with them, um, yeah, we could see silver at fourfold, the 600. So 
we could see silver around 2500 bucks an ounce. That would be... Am I saying that? No, I think I'm doing a 4 to 1 ratio. Um, I don't know. I got lost in my math. But we'll just say significantly higher silver prices um, in the hundreds and maybe gold at 10000 So are we going to return to that? Um, well, it was, it was encouraging that uh, looking at the historical trend that the blowout inflation, which was stopped, by the way, through ridiculously high interest rates, and it does not appear that um, our current Fed chair is another Paul Volcker. Uh, I really don't think so. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about gold coins. Um, but back to the overhead resistance, you know, when when will these gold coins... Uh, this is at max. I set up for one ounce gold coins. Um, when does the overhead resistance of people taking profit feedback in i don't think that people holding silver or gold eagles or gold buffaloes are really going to significantly affect the gold price uh they're selling either way but when do central banks decide to sell or what are they going to sell for if they're repatriating their gold a cbdc i don't know your guess is as good as mine but i wanted to look at some gold uh because i did notice uh, I was shopping for gold recently and I looked at the fractionals and I really didn't like the premiums that were on the fractionals. The, the higher you get, uh, I mean, the smaller you get in the fractionals, the higher the premium percentage. You know, so if you're looking at something as small as a one tenth ounce gold eagle, the premiums are ridiculous. But I did want to point out here that we have. Um, the one that I was looking at was definitely the gold buffalo. Uh, now, the the gold eagle, you can see here that Atmex is charging the cheapest we can get. It is twenty five eighty one for a random year gold eagle. So we're at twenty four sixty nine. So that's that's a hundred and change, maybe a hundred and fifteen dollars above spot. Now that's a great deal, 115 above spot for gold. But I want you to remember that this eagle, um, let's see if we can get more details on it. Um, these US minted gold eagles are not one ounce of gold. These are, let's see, where is it? These are 0.9167 fine gold. So they're 92% gold, also known as 22 karat. Well, it's not .999 fine gold eagles. Can st oh, still contains one troy ounce of gold by weight. Interesting. So correct me if I'm wrong. I may be wrong here. I was thinking that these are not the best deal um, because the gold buffalo here is let's just read the specs on it I believe it's point not yeah it contains one ounce of point nine 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 fine gold so apparently it's they both contain an ounce of gold um, so your, your gold eagle is going to be a little bit heavier because it's made, uh, they used to do this with gold and silver in the past all the time because if it's too fine, then it will wear away and it can't be used as coinage. So I believe that the gold eagle was designed uh, to be coinage or at least based on the idea of being coinage. So we're looking at 2581 for the random year one ounce eagle. And we're looking at 2591 for the one ounce gold buffalo. You can get a buffalo here, an MS69 PCGS, um, for like, you know, a, the same price. Uh, I would go ahead and do that. I, I mean, I don't attach a lot of 
value to these numismatics, but it does come sealed. You know, it's it's got a um, it's got a grade on it, and it's got a serial number for the grading. So, kind of cool. Yeah, I'd probably pick this one up instead of uh, just the regular one. Um, if you can get into a PCGS. Yeah, it's a PCGS certified. So yeah, um, buck 20 is what we're looking at. Now how does that, how does that jive historically as far as um, what are premiums at uh, when we're having bull moves? That I don't know. So, uh, and again, this, as I said before about the silver market, this uh, bull market is not being driven by the small investor. Let's see how many they have. Uh, did I close that? Um, so let's go back to, for example, random year, gold eagle. Um, I don't know if they have the limitations on it as far as kind of around number 250. Um, they probably have more because it's called sales account manager. So probably can get more. Doesn't seem to be any limit on the amount of gold eagles you can buy. But as far as historically, uh, what premiums tend to be when we're breaking out, I don't know. That'd be something for someone else to research. So just to wrap up here, now I'm not going to say anything about the news events. Uh, let me say this. Uh, because there's a lot of rabbit holes I don't want to go down and recent events are absolutely crazy um, but in regard to recent events I think uh, what's the saying uh, don't believe anything that you hear and believe only half of what you see I think I would put an addendum on that and don't believe anything that you see online <laughs> because um, yeah, uh, we'll let uh, historians sort out what actually happened if you know what I'm saying. So uh, let's summarize some of the markets here. Now we were looking at the two year and the two year has broken down, although not decisively, but you know, you can see that we were comfortably above 5%. Roughly five and a quarter was the top. And you can see we're down to 4.4. So that's that's quite a bit uh, in the scheme of things for interest rates. The, the recent moves in interest rates have been, from a historical perspective, just uh, absolutely very uh, dramatic and violent. So historically, this is a pretty good move. Uh, now the one year, uh, I don't have any trend lines on it, but it has started to roll over pretty well. I want to take you over to the 10 year. Uh, I'm going to point out again, remember that this, this one month, which is pretty much the equivalent of the overnight, is the Fed set rate. This is what the Fed controls, the very shortest of the short end. And the two year, it is said, it is said that the two year leads the Fed. This is the market voting. Uh, with its feet, we'll say, um, leaving um, businesses uh, indicating that things are bad. Uh, that's the market voting on that information. And then the 10-year is going to be the most important because that is going to be what in, uh, mortgage interest rates are set on. And that's effectively really the only long-term yield that are, that's out there for investors. So looking at the 10-year, you can see that we kind of uh, had a little bounce right back up to that trend line. So that's, now I never am married to a trend line. Uh, trend lines are approximations. I only draw trend lines in a chart when the chart is screaming at me, draw a line. There's something here. Uh, but I don't draw trend lines unless I see that. And there's some of these trend lines I need to extend back out. So the 10 year seems to say interest rate cuts are on the way. Uh, we've got the two year and the 10 year. A lot of people are talking about yield curve inversion, yield curve compression. I think what's happening right now um, is that the yield 
curve is uh, steepening a little less. Uh, we've had an inverted or semi-inverted yield curve for I think the longest time in history that we know that we've kept records. So yeah, it looks like we're gonna get a uh, bear market in interest rates, we're gonna get interest rate cuts. And anecdotally, there's a lot of noise about uh, how bad things are getting behind the scenes because we know we can't trust the official numbers. So let's look at some other markets here. I wanted to look at Bitcoin real quick. We know that Bitcoin is said to be, or I shall say not Bitcoin, BTC. BTC is said to be digital gold. Um, so is it acting like that right now? Well, it's not, it's not making new highs, but um, yeah, even nominally, uh, we've got quite a ways to go. So we're still at about the high that was made back in 2021. We're below the high that was made in uh, 2000, late 2021, and then we're, we're behind these recent ones. But it has definitely snapped back. I was surprised. Um, my charts told me that uh, we had a pretty established trend line. We've broken below it, and uh, we just really bottomed out and started to rally up. So it looks like Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general may be making another run at it. So yeah, I I like the uh, buffaloes and the eagles in the in the PCGS. Uh, I like the $120 premium. I like the fact that there's plenty of gold. Um, I don't like that the price is what it is because I'm a buy the dip sort of person. So go ahead and close with this. Um, what I found over the years, if you're investing in markets, there's, there's two ways pretty much to invest in markets if you're talking about long-term or semi-long-term. You could be a technical trader and for the most part, technical traders uh, prefer to buy breakouts. So you can see in gold, we had a very perfect technical breakout here. Uh, and uh, most technical traders are looking for a breakout, a new price high, especially if they're new all-time highs, but a new high, a recent high, a pullback, and then a buy. So a breakout buyer puts you in at about 2200 on gold. Now that's a technical trade. That's a person who's buying based on technicals. That's probably not a person who believes in the fundamentals. If you believe in the fundamentals of something, then ideally you want to buy the dips. Uh, I'll give you an example, one that I recently traded and had my eye on was AT&T stock. And one of the reasons I liked AT&T stock, um, I think I bought some in a 401k back, uh, back in the fall. Uh, it was yielding, the dividend yield on the stock was, I believe, 8.5%. Very, very high. And uh, the telecommunications sector and everything else had just not... Uh, moved at all. It had just been pretty much dead. Huge money-making sector. I mean, AT&T and both Verizon, I was buying both of these stocks, uh, both with good dividend yields and uh, very, very oversold. So when you're trading a stock or commodity or anything else, uh, and you're investing from a fundamental perspective, then you want to buy the dips. And that's what I was doing, was buying it as it fell. Because I didn't really care how long I held it. It yielded 8%. Um, so when you're buying that way, sort of maybe you could call it a Warren Buffett type buying, then you want to buy the dips. It's certainly uh, probably one of the worst times for a fundamental investor to buy gold. But for a technical investor, yeah, new highs, that's a time to buy. Um, so yeah, if you're stacking short-term, 
Um, maybe your person, I mean, I can't imagine anybody really doing this, but if you're a short-term person and you're stacking, uh, maybe you want, you're expecting gold to go from 2,500 to 10,000 and then you're going to make uh, four times your money, pocket the money and go buy something. Yeah, that's a great buy signal. Um, everything is looking great. Uh, I think that uh, silver will probably want to catch up with recent news events and world events coming very, very quickly. Um, we could see some real fireworks and we'll talk to you next time.